Hey, welcome back to The Dive. The U.S. March jobs report, aggressive rate hikes, his stance on recession talks, oil, cryptocurrencies, and sectors that he thinks have the most upside potential in Q2 are the topics that our guest will deep dive into today. He's a senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg and one of our regulars here at The Dive, Mike McGlone is joining us today. But before we bring Mike on, do me one quick favor and go ahead and just hit that subscribe button, please. Hey, Mike, welcome back to The Dive. Well, hello, Cassandra. It's good to be back. OK, so let's start off with the U.S. March jobs report. Employers added 431,000 jobs while the jobless rate fell to 3.6% from 3.8% a month earlier. It's the 11th straight month of job gains above 400,000 and the longest stretch of growth in records dating all the way back to 1939. What impact do you think job data is having on the markets? Well, most notable, Cassandra, from as an ex-bond trader, was a significant flat lean of U.S. Treasury curve. I saw that long bond jump up to almost like 2.55, then drop to like 2.45. Yet uh, the two-year note yield jumped like 10 to 12 basis points. So significant flattening, inversion of the curve, pointing it to the uh, you know towards recession, and emboldening the Fed to keep raising rates. So yeah, I think it just solidifies the view that the Fed has to raise rates. We have. Um, a bit of an inflation problem, and that re jobs report reflects it. The thing is, it's past performance. It's the March report of next year that I'm really concerned about. And right now, what I see for markets is probably going to be a lot weaker than this, this year's report. How aggressive do you think the rate hikes from the Fed will be? Well, they're going to be really aggressive until the stock market gets the message. And the key thing I've, I like the, the narrative I've heard is the Fed has to reduce the ability of people to buy stuff. Um, that means 401ks and relative assets or inflation will not go down. It's just a, a fact of usual way it works. Um, so I think the way it works is every time Mr. Powell gets up in the morning, he sees the stock market's up and or crude miles up, he's had to say, OK, I'll just be more aggressive. So right now he's hinted at 50 base points at the next few meetings. I fully expect that unless the stock market starts helping the job to do the jobs fed, the Fed's job for them to help reduce some of these excessive demand pull in the economy. Now, everyone is talking about an upcoming recession due to the inverted two-year and 10-year Treasury yields. Last time we spoke, you also mentioned a recession. So we've got to know, do you still think we're heading into a recession? And what metrics are you focused yeah. on? Well, all the above. And I look at it as um, and these things can come sometimes be somewhat lagging. I mean, they're supposed to be leading. The bottom line for a recession is once the U.S. stock market declines, then we'll get the recession. And I didn't say yes. It's just a matter of time. Is it going to happen this year, next year, or five years from now? It's overdue for a reversion period. What we saw at the beginning there was the most extended stock market, most extended commodities market, and most extended inflation it all combined in about 60 years. That's if you can put them all together. I use a 60-month average. So to me, this is all you need is a spark for reversion. We have the war, and we have, I think, it's the, the hangover factor from the most extreme combination of QE, quantitative easing, and, and, my, and fiscal um, stimulus, meaning the, the, the government is writing checks to people in a long time. So once that all wears off and this wealth effect wears off, um, we're way overdue. And this is just part of the, I think, hitting that inflection point. And to me, I'll end with this. The bottom line is the stock market needs a decent correction. And if we don't get that, the Fed's just going to keep raising rates. Now, you've written a lot about oil. And since the war in Ukraine started, we've seen an increased oil price. How do you read the recent price action in oil? Do you think that we will see $50 a barrel oil again in a few years? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, first, let's look at simple facts of crude oil. The last time it had a, a, a rally of this velocity versus its 100-week moving average was never. <laughs> versus its 200-week moving average is only two examples in history, 2008 and 1990. And I was in the trading pits in 1990, and crude oil went from 20 to 40. 
and then back to 20. And it took 14 years to go back above that high. I see parallels. We had a high around 130 in WTI, which is still below the high from 2008, which is the peak. And I think we're going back to an enduring um, bear market. The big significance now versus the past is US and most notably Canada, North America is a substantial excessive producer of liquid fuels, crude oil, um, LNG is part of that. It's not so much liquid, uh, biofuels. And that was the big difference. And that's accelerating on most notably in the back of higher prices. So I think the thing that happened with crude oil is it wasn't um, COVID that shut off the supply excesses coming from North America. It was lower prices. Now we're going back. It just takes a little time to revert. But the primary force that pressured crude oil down to an average price of around 50 since 2014. To me, it's just resuming now that prices are around $100 a barrel. And I fully expect, and I think it's much more likely to go back to 50 than trade above 150. 150 means pretty substantial global recession, some kind of supply shock I don't predict. And I'll end with this. One key thing, the market's priced for supply shock, yet all that Russia crude is probably going to go to China. I don't think it's a shock. It's just a transition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on and talk about cryptocurrencies a cryptocurrency startup that operates a popular online game called Axie Infinity said that hackers stole more than 500 million worth of cryptocurrencies, making it the largest theft in DeFi history. Do you think events like these should have an impact on the willingness of investors to participate in crypto? Yes, it's well, I, I think so. These kind of events certainly are part of the pushback you hear from investors who are just starting to dip tip their toes into the water. But then it was Axie. It wasn't, uh, you know, one of the bigger ones, the Bitcoins, the Ethereums, or any of the crypto dollars, which are really more significant. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pushback, but it's one of those things to be addressed and just make the market stronger. It's kind of impressive how I didn't really have any reaction. But the key thing about cryptos this year is, they are part of this ebbing tide of the lower stock market and the Federal Reserve fighting inflation. It's not just the Federal Reserve, almost all central banks in Western countries. Yet they're coming out ahead. Like, for instance, on the year, Bitcoin's almost unchanged and the Nasdaq's down about 8%. Yet Bitcoin trades about three times the volatility of the Nasdaq. So I see what's happening is um, cryptos are showing divergent strength. They should continue to come out ahead. And what I'm sensing is there's bids below markets and most know the main cryptos like Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the others. And there's offers above the market and equities. And I think that's going to continue. But overall, the greater risk is the tide ebbs a little further. The Nasdaq and S&P 500 make new lows in the year, which is likely. And Bitcoin follows that but comes out ahead. Okay, great. So one more thing before we let you go here, Mike, as we're moving into Q2, what commodities or sectors do you think have the most upside potential? Uh, I, I'm in Q2, I th think as we head towards the end of the year, the whole ebbing tide is going to continue. I see crude oil has the least, um, the most greatest risk to head lowered, head towards 50 and very unlikely to rally another 50%. I see copper kind of following crude oil lower. Um, and that's going to be part of that ebbing tide if the stock market continues to decline, which I think it will. I see the grains hanging in there, at least until the fall, until we see what comes out of supply from Russia, Ukraine. Um, I see gold doing better, and I see Bitcoin and Ethereum probably some of the best performing assets. And one key thing that I'll end with is I think the U.S. long bond is going to be the better of it particularly if we start to see the ebbing tide roll back over, which I think is going to be the key theme of this year. And that is mean reversion and risk asset stock market, crude oil going lower, housing market potentially falling, all being pressured by the Federal Reserve and coming out ahead should be Bitcoin, gold and long bonds. That's kind of my, my view for this year. And it's been that way for a while, but I think it's just had a little bit of a diversion with the war and now it should go back to um, enduring trends. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mike, and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. To our audience at home, thank you so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again tomorrow, so hit that notification bell so you don't miss out.